speaker series is hosted by the Keenan Institute of Private Enterprise, made possible through the generous support of the Archie K. Davis Endowment. Uh, it was started many years ago by MBA students and designed to bring together outstanding scholars and leaders from business, education, and the government to share thoughts and insights uh, here at the school for the university and the, the uh, community at large. Today we have uh, Hope Holden Bryant. She's the vice chairman of First Citizens Bank. Hope earned her BA here at the university in English and then her MBA from Kenan Flagler. Banking is a family business for Hope. She and her brother Frank Holden represent the third generation of Holden family leadership. The bank was founded in 1898. Uh, it served as Johnston County's sole bank and primarily served agricultural customers. Uh, my little uh, connection ho uh, hope is that uh, my beginning of learning about accounting and finance and banking was from my grandfather, uh, who was a, was a customer of First Citizens. And I can remember he had his, he'd bring out us all his ledger, and my key thing I remember him saying was, never spend money you don't have. So um, That's a very good that was uh, uh, the kind of customer a bank would ha want to have. Um, the bank has expanded across the state of North Carolina, across the U.S. It is now one of the top 20 uh, largest banks in America and recently um, had an acquisition and merger with CIT Group. Uh, Hope started there in 1985. Today her responsibilities include management and markets in 12 states and oversight of wealth management and business services. One of the most re rewarding aspects of her career has been her involvement in taking business to new markets and helping the company establish banking operations in locations far from uh, North Carolina, including California, Texas, and Washington State. I have a few questions for her, and then we'll throw the floor open uh, to uh, the audience. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to have you back home in Chapel Hill. Well, I'll tell you, it is great to be in Chapel Hill. I, when uh, you invited me, um, to come speak in late March. I really did have visions of a beautiful Carolina blue sky and plenty of sunshine, <laughs> but I was thrilled to be able to park in front of the building. Uh, and Benita came outside, knocked on the window, and said, are you Hope Bryant? And um, I said, yes, she goes, well, that's good, because you were really going to get it. I still have <laughs> dreams of parking issues in Chapel Hill. So um, it was a long, yeah, a long hike from the rest of campus. Well, the statute of limitations has run out on any uh, <laughs> penalties you might have from, bank, from uh, parking mistakes. Um, well, we do not have a beautiful sky um, and spring weather, but we do have a Final Four. So. Go Heels. Um, So, I, this morning I was thinking about, and I will read off some names that will be quite familiar to you as well as me, that no longer exist. Uh, NCNB, Nations Bank, Wachovia, First Union, BB&T, Central Carolina, and the list could go on and on and on. Um, these were all banks that were very prominent at one time or another in North Carolina, and successors to them in various forms still exist. Um, First Citizens has been around for a long, long time. I said my grandfather banked there. Uh, tell me a little bit of how First Citizens has survived and thrived through depression, expansion, um, uh, financial crisis, now pandemic, multiple generations. We know family businesses oftentimes don't survive uh, multiple generations. What's the secret sauce and a little bit of the history of your bank? Well, um, you're right. North Carolina um, has been a powerhouse in the banking industry um, in, in more recent times. But back in 1898, uh, there were not many banks. And it was not a regulated industry. The banks were largely owned by individuals. And they were not in small towns. So um, our organization was established in 1898 in Smithfield, North Carolina, which is about 30 miles east of Raleigh. And it was really people coming together to, to try to build a bank to support and help an agricultural town prosper. So my grandfather um, had been, and he was a very young man in his 20s, had come to the bank as the cashier. And um, basically their philosophy then, as it is now, is to run the bank very conservatively. 
that many of those privately owned banks were highly speculative in nature. They, they lended um, speculatively, they invested speculatively, and um, that was not the, the mindset uh, of my grandfather and the peer, his peers that were running the bank, that it was really about um, having a long-term vision to support this town. And so when the depression hit, although there were several runs on the bank, it did not fail. When other banks were failing, that actually was a time of expansion for, for, for citizens. And, um, and again, at that time, the, the markets weren't very efficient. They would go door to door and, and try to sell shares to, to gain capital for expansion. And when um, the shares couldn't be sold, my grandfather and, and others would buy them personally. So during the, it was during the 30s that, that my family gained a controlling interest in the company. And I think that that was definitely a legacy of um, long-term thinking, conservative management, and, but, but also a mindset of how to be opportunistic and prepare yourself to be opportunistic for expansion. So let's jump all the way up to this year, CIT comes into the fold. What's the thinking about that? And I'm always intrigued when you've got two large entities come together is how do you make the culture one? How do you maintain the culture of the values you just talked about in First Citizens? Because I know there has been a a ton of acquisitions. You've been involved with many of them over the years. Uh, let me back up just a little bit and talk about expansion because I think that the in our company, um, while we have been very acquisitive over the years, it comes in fits and starts. So back during the Depression, we expanded. But we've also married that ex um, acquisition strategy with solid organic growth. And, and we pay attention to both. That um, So during the... my father's generation, that uh, my grandfather died in, in his mid-50s, le leaving three boys. The three boys are under the age of 30. They pick up this little small bank, and they begin to run it and expand it. So um, during the SNL crisis of the late 80s, mm -hmm. all right, that became another expansion opportunity for them. During the Great Recession, um, in my brother was running the company, and he realized very quickly, as a great capacity for detail, and realized that the, particularly the early failed banks, that there was very little risk to taking on, on um, these opportunities. So we had been on the West Coast for about a decade by that point, and we became one of the largest acquirers of failed banks in the country, picking up several in California, um, one in Washington State, um, two or three in Colorado. And, and from there, we realized that um, geography really didn't make a difference. And, and I'll talk about this later when, when we talk about maybe technology, that, that collecting, because it was mostly about collecting bad debt, which because we were uh, very conservative lenders, we actually, the challenge wasn't as much expanding. It was we didn't have people to collect bad debt because we really didn't lend to, to um, marginal borrowers, so we had, had to kind of learn that one. But when you were talking about CIT, more recently, um, and this is what I call my brother's superpower, that he sees opportunity in things that others just don't. And um, when he first mentioned that he was looking at CIT, he sort of has a list of um, opportunities that I had to make myself be quiet is he talking about? Because for citizens is, you know, we still consider ourselves to be a small regional bank. Um, we're very conservative. You know, we do what we do, which is um, we're not trying to be all things to all people and kind of play in our space. CIT, very long tenured, I mean, they've probably been around more than 100 years, but um, we're predominantly known as being a specialty finance company. And, and if you had said, look at the risk curve. Ours was on one end, theirs would have been perceived to have been on the other. But what, what I didn't realize that he had kind of stumbled onto was that they had a $10 billion bank, um, largely in Southern California, and they had a community association banking business um, that they had acquired through Mutual of Omaha Bank, which we had had an interest in, um, that was um, 
maybe $10 billion. They have these specialty uh, lines of business, rail, factoring, commercial finance, uh, but they had been de-risking them for five years as they were trying to position themselves away from the perception of a commercial finance company, trying to look more like a bank. But what they couldn't figure out was their funding, that we have over 500 uh, banking offices, and our cost of fund we have a very stable, low-cost funding base that's a real key to our success. So matching our stable, low-cost funding with their efficient lending um, and really bringing our uh, risk tolerances together actually put us at peer. So it, it is weirdly synergistic and, and we're super excited about it. And, and it has taken us from, um, you know, to be a top 20 bank in the United States, which is incredible to me. That's very interesting. Now you mentioned, I, I know you guys have made a lot of investments in technology. Uh, and you mentioned technology helping to narrow the regional differences. Mm -hmm. Elaborate on that. So we are n have never been bleeding edge technology, probably far from it. Uh, we would like to think that we are fast followers, but um, the thing that I think that we have been good about is really trying to leverage technology within the space that, that, that we're trying to play to create um, either value for the company, value for our customers. And um, a couple of examples of that would be in the late, well, late 1990s with the introduction of image technology. My uncle realized that um, he no longer to ha had to have a data center to process work. And without having to have a data center, you could go anywhere. So we were predominantly in the Carolinas. We had just gone to Georgia and Florida. Um, but this allowed him to go to Texas, California and Arizona in, in early 2000. Um, you know, more recently, after we did the, several of the failed banks, we, we started doing them in our footprint because we had leadership there. But with the advances in digital banking, we realized that we could, do, we could buy failed banks anywhere. And if they only had a couple of branches, they, they didn't have enough critical mass to really be sustainable, those customers could continue to be served very well on our digital banking platform. And, and now I think as we're thinking about how do we, um, CIT's banking business uh, was one west and in Southern California, as so we're thinking about how do we create scale in our consumer banking business, um, what we are on the West Coast is a little bit more of a business banking bank. We have a very thin branch network. Um, as we're thinking about how to create scale in our processes, what we're really focusing our digital investments on now, other than improving digital banking for our customers, is trying to figure out how do we streamline processes to make it easier for clients to do business with us, easier for our associates to do their jobs. And um, if you think of things like DocuSign, in, in our organization, we wrestled with, can we do DocuSign? Is it too scary and risky and is it legal? Nothing like a good pandemic to get you <laughs> over the hump. And we were doing those PPP loans. I'm telling you, DocuSign, everybody thought it was a great idea. And so now we're, we're trying to take um, lessons learned like that, that from the pandemic to, to extend them across our organization uh, predominantly to, to create scale. Well, that was, that's perfect lead into my very next question was, going to be, what have you learned from the pandemic? Oh, so many lessons from the pandemic um, that nobody ever wants to learn again. Uh, you know, I think that the, um, for us, some of the things that were most critical was, one, the importance of data. That um, we had invested a lot of um, time and energy and resources into building infrastructure that we thought we were going to have to use for stress testing as our bank was getting bigger. But under the, the Trump administration, they changed the rules, raised the limits. Um, so we had been um, using that infrastructure to improve our, our credit analytics. So data, when, when the pandemic hit, within a week, we could actually look across our, our entire loan book and, and see where we might have issues. And what we realized literally within a week was that we didn't have any problems. Now our client selection, we play in the top 10 to 15% of asset quality. And, and we were not um, 
lending into many asset classes that, that would have been um, hurt more severely. But a decade ago, we wouldn't have been able to see it, and we're getting this daily refresh. It, it's real time. We can talk with our regulators about it. That uh, the quality of the data allowed us to uh, reassure our clients and um, really be very proactive in, in having them take loan deferrals, put the PPP loan um, program together, and also many of our customers were finding opportunities. So we were able to, to help lend them money to give them capital to lean into the opportunity. So data was key. The second thing that we learned was um, empowering and pushing decision making down that we, we had a lot of conversations about philosophically what, what do we want to do as a, as a company and, um, and would we pay people combat pay? Would we pay people not to come to work? And we said, no, we're going to pay people to work. We're going to keep our doors open for our customers. And I actually have two of my children that were working in our branches, so it, it really wasn't either they were safe or they weren't that you couldn't just throw a few extra dollars at that. But, but to say we're gonna keep it open, that had to be figured out at a local level. And, and hats off to, to our local leaders working with their teams to figure out how to do that, that, that our executive team has never been more proud of the way our associates took care of their clients, but they also took care of one another and um, we talk a lot about our culture and I think that that was a, a big cultural moment. And, um, you know, I think that the, if, if there was a, a, a third one was um, the infrastructure in place and, and how to do things remotely. That 75% of our workforce went home overnight and never came back. And, and we had made a lot of investments in technology that really positioned us to do that successfully. I think that now we're, we're wrestling with how do we get them back, but um, it was a really good um, lesson learned was that you have to continue to invest in your infrastructure and create flexibility there because um, the business model can change on a dime. You mentioned culture. Tell me how you would describe First Citizens culture. You know, we are a publicly traded company, but we are the largest family controlled bank in the country. And I think that um, that our family ownership uh, pervades our culture, that um, we attract people that like to work well together. We're, we take a very long-term mindset, and um, we do things as, as teams. And um, so we tend to attract people that have that same mindset. We, we try not, we think that there is a right way and a wrong way, and, um, and really creating value for our customers, creating value for our shareholders over the long term. When I say we attract a certain person, um, even strong individual performers may not work well in our culture. Um, there can be um, credit that it's credit worthy it just doesn't work for us, that we don't ch tend to chase transactions. We want clients that, that want to do business, with, repeat business with us because we think we add value better over time. And same with, with associates, that uh, we want people and, and try to attract people that want to grow with our company. And, um, and so consequently, they, they really get to know each other. And it's interesting, I think in, in the previous generation, my father and his brother, um, they had different mindsets. My father loved small town, absence of competition. All, we have a lot of branches that are east of 95 in the Carolinas, and I'm telling you, my daddy loved every one of them. <laughs> they might not have all looked good, but they were all very precious to him. His brother in the late 90s said, you know, give me a child's portion of a large market. And, and so he took our company to first to Atlanta um, and, and down into Florida, and then to Austin, Texas, to Orange County, California, San Diego, um, Sacramento, the, these big urban markets. And I am sure my father was just like, oh my God, what? And in fact, a lot of people in our company were like, what in the world are we doing in California? And, and really, they were both right. 
And after my uncle passed away, I took my dad, it's one of my favorite trips. My dad was in his 80s. And I said, you, I want you to come with me to California. And so we go out there. And, and literally, it's, it's like the United Nations. <laughs> they are the most multicultural groups we have. But their clients mirror our clients in the Carolinas. They're medical, professional, small businesses. And, and these people now have worked with us 15 and 20 years. And, and they're like family. And it, it, is, it is just kind of, it's a very interesting thing to me that, that you can walk into any of our branches and you do sort of feel it. That, that they've worked together a long time. A lot of them hang out together after work. And they generally like each other. That's very neat. Um, so we always have a lot of students that come from family businesses themselves. Over the years, when I talk with them, they they have the challenge of trying to figure out: um, Do I go back to the family business? Do I go somewhere else? Do I go somewhere else and someday go back to the family business? I am sure that you and other members of your family have wrestled with this. How did you work through that yourself? I was so conflicted, uh, and I'm sure I overanalyzed it coming um, out out of Keenan Flagler that, um, yes, you do always wonder, you know, is, should, is there something outside of the organization? Um, all of my career has been with First Citizens. But when I was coming out of business school, did I want to work for a small company? I really enjoyed finance and thought, well, maybe a small company where, where I could really put my hands on a lot of different things and, and do something interesting there. Um, there were a lot of failed banks, so I considered, should I work for the Resolution Trust Company? And, and really learn about these banks that were failing and maybe there's a lesson learned there. Um, I, consulting was big, and I'm sure it's still big here. And um, really thought about that until I kind of um, kind of ran that one by my father, who must have had some horrible experience with consulting. <laughs> because, I mean, my father was a very gentle, nice man, and he ripped into me and said something about borrowing a watch and paying somebody to tell you what time it was. And just like... <laughs> Okay, well, I, I, maybe I won't do that. Um, so ultimately, while I went back to work for our company, um, I have honestly changed jobs. I've always been based out of Raleigh, but I've honestly changed jobs about every two or three years. So um, my learning around our company, I, I've done probably everything except IT and ops but, and a lot of different geographies. So um, you're in a in the uh, industry that we think of as male dominated. You're a prominent uh, woman leader in that industry. Um, there are not a lot of women, as we know, CEOs of major companies and, and these sorts of things. How do you think about that? What, what insights do you have for us uh, as a woman who's a leader in uh, a, an industry that is mostly male dominated? You know, I, I'll try to share a couple of different perspectives with you. One is, it is not all bad, because I, and I will tell you, I have clearly had opportunities that I would not have had had I not been a woman. And, and an example of that would be I had um, the privilege of serving as the chair of the North Carolina Bankers Association, which was something that my grandfather and my, my uncle had, had done um, when I was in my early 30s, probably. And, and I've been asked to, to be a part of organizations that have been predominantly male-oriented, and they're trying. They want female representation, and, and I've definitely had some terrific experiences because they were looking for somebody like me. Um, in our company, um, you know, I think, well, I'll talk generally, uh, not just our company, but more broadly as being a female in a male-dominated industry. A couple of things there that you need to be self-aware, but also think about the just un, unintended biases of people, that they're, they're not necessarily trying to, um, to put you down, but it's just not their experience. And so I will talk about my, our own company, because my mother was a stay-at-home mom. My, my father, my uncle, their mother was a stay-at-home mom. They didn't have... Um, any role models of, of women in their lives working. And I, I applaud my father for encouraging all of us to work in our company, but I'm telling you, I think he was totally stunned when I was like, I like this, and I'm kind of good at it, and I want to keep working. And um, my uncle, 
actually was the one who gave me the opportunity to run um, the, our businesses outside of the Carolinas. It was, uh, the bank was called Ironstone then. And in, in later years, I asked my dad, I kind of had to call him out a little bit on it, and said, I get the sense that you wouldn't have, have given me that opportunity that, that your brother did. And he goes, I absolutely wouldn't have. Why on earth would I have wanted the mother of my grandchildren flying all over the country and not being with them? Um, well, little did he know they were probably better off that I wasn't helicoptering in and <laughs> causing all kinds of damage. But it was really interesting. It wasn't that he didn't think that I could have done a good job. It was just outside of his frame of reference and, and his comfort zone, probably. So having, for me, having some very strong mentors, um, some were women, some were men, that would tell me I had one great mentor that um, looked at me one day and said, you know you're in a dead-end job, right? And I'm like, what? That I didn't see it that way. You know, somebody, and I had kind of worked my way around and getting different experiences. And he was like, oh yeah, that is not going anywhere. And you need somebody to kind of help you um, see the things that, that you may not see and, and to help position you a little bit. And, and I'm sure he helped my uncle see that, um, that I could solve a problem. The other deal is it's not because you're a woman. I think that, that you need to figure out how do you just, whether you're male or female, how do you add value and, and how can you become a problem solver in, in your company, but position yourself to be there. I, th I think that the other, couple other things that I see with women, um, our motivation is slightly different that they don't always having the gold ring or, or getting to the next level isn't always the motivation. A lot of women just like doing what they're doing because they're making a difference. They enjoy, they just enjoy their jobs for, for different things. And that, because we're not maybe promoting ourselves or, or pushing to get the next thing, that, that we should do a little bit more of that. And I, I would also say we should ask for, re, make sure we're asking for resources to be, to do the job well. Um, I, I find that women, myself included, take on too much ourselves. And this was another learning from my mentor, and I still have to ask myself, all right, would, would he be doing this? And most of the time I go, heck no, he wouldn't. He'd have those golf clubs, and he'd be out playing golf right now, not dealing with the mess that I'm dealing with. So you, you have to not take that on and learn how to lead through others and deal with stuff so that you can be successful. Mm. Because the men, I'm telling you, the men are dealing with that stuff. They're not, they're not putting up with a lot of stuff that women, I think, maybe were just more nurturing by nature. Thank you. I've got one more thing, and I'm going to throw it to the floor. A um, lot of talk these days about stakeholder capitalism, ESG, uh, all these sorts of things. Where, where are you on that? Where is First Citizens on that? Um, you know, I, I thought this question was really interesting. And I, for us, maybe it's because of our ownership structure, our long-term mindset, but I think that, that we have been practicing stakeholder capitalism since our inception, that, that what we realize in, in the space that we're playing is that if we don't have the, if we're trying to serve our clients well and we want them to continue to do business with us, we have to have the best people. And, um, and so we're, we're constantly trying to serve our clients. We're, we're trying to attract and retain the best associates. You know, we're trying to be fair to our shareholders. Again, there are, many of them are our siblings. And, um, and, and finding a way to strike that balance, to me, works better if, if you can take a long-term view. But it's not, um, and, and it's kind of woven into how we do what we do. That we, um, if you look at our internal tagline, that um, it is better today's, or sorry, I'm blanking on that. Um, but it's a real focus on our clients, our um, customers, communities, our associates, and it really is trying to get better outcomes 
for, for a better world, that it's not just an internal mindset, but, but really thinking about communities. Think about the communities that, um, you know, when I said we're east of 95, these are not high growth places. And so from the early days, there was a lot of investment back into the communities, whether it's our bank leadership, and, and you commented about, um, I think, banking in general, the um, Hugh McCalls that invest in this building, you know, John Allison with, with the bb and A lot of these small towns, when, when the good work that was being done, it was because the bankers and the business owners were, were giving back because they knew that it's honestly good for business. It's a little self-serving. But, but I think that that's the um, ESG works better when you can find the win-win um, across all of those stakeholders. And I think that they're, they're different, and maybe it's ownership when you, and I'm not picking on private equity um, folks, but, but those that are driving, measuring success by um, how, how quickly you're making money or is your stock price moving, that's not necessarily connected as tightly as, as it might be to um, are you creating a platform for winners across all of your stakeholders. Mm -hmm. The floor is open. Hey, uh, Evan Parker, it's great to hear from you again. I know it's been a while since we last connected, but you briefly touched on the struggle that you're having with getting workers to come back into the office. Would just be interested from your perspective as a leader, what are some of the things you're wrestling with as you, as you do that? You know, I think that, so we, we've talked a lot about our culture at First Citizens. And one of the top things that comes to mind for me is how do you get people to have a shared cultural framework if they're not together? Um, for, for younger people that are entering the, the workforce, how do you get them on board? How do, you, how do they learn? We have very long-tenured people. Honestly, we, we need you learning from, from each other that um, the mindset that, that you in the room um, bring about how, what we do is the same, but how we do it is changing rapidly. So we need your thought process coming in, but I think the, the new talent also needs to hear from the old because, again, there's, there's a lot of institutional knowledge and in, in the why we do what we do. Um, we don't want to change the what, we just want to change the how do we get at it. Um, the connectivity to the company, if you don't know people, and, and I struggle to get to know people. I mean, I was glad to see him on Zoom because I needed something, but uh, I think it, it, you just don't get that same kind of connectivity with people. So there's the whole cultural deal. I think that the, um, then you get other practical matters about, we have a lot of branches, a lot of office space. Do we need it all? You know, how do you, what kind of office space do you need? Are they kind of rotating in and out? There are just a lot of practical um, things with that that um, we'll be wrestling. We're, we're in the, right in the throes of, of wrestling with. Over here. Hi, I'm from Great to see you today. Um, sticking with the topic of We look at our attrition quite a lot. Um, <laughs> you know, I think it plays out differently. Um, and and I'll say that the one that we are struggling with, um, or challenged, almost say struggling, challenged with with retention, but it but it kind of plays out differently. So in areas like the West Coast, um, where we have some large bank competitors that have made some interesting decisions in, in their organization, it's, it is easier to recruit top talent than, than it has ever been. Because I think that, and I will tell you in, in the Carolinas where there's some other large um, mergers going on, 
that they're having cultural clashes. And, and our culture resonates um, with, with some of those teams that have been accustomed to, to being in, in Eastern North Carolina and, and feel, I won't say family, but, but a, a tight knit. It doesn't feel big bank. It, it's felt more smaller bank. Um, we have attracted some terrific talent. I think that the, the bigger pain point for us is really on the lower end. So when you think about tellers or entry level associates that um, there's so many other options and um, to, to get the, the pay that people are having to, to put out now to run their businesses, um, it creates a lot of competition for lower skilled. And then you can imagine the ripple effect through the, the company. If you're bringing in the least skilled person at this dollar, then we, it creates internal equity issues, which kind of gets people stirred up. But I think for us that that's, um, and if you can't keep the lower level positions filled, then you're dragging your higher people into having to do this work. So we're really wrestling with that more than um, being picked off in, in the upper levels of our company. Over here. Hi, my name's Paige Smith. I'm the incoming consulting club president, so hopefully it's not as your, bad as your dad said. <laughs> <laughs> in my pre-MBA life, did a lot of community work and know that relationship between a bank and the community is really critical. But imagine that's going to continue to be a challenge as physical spaces change. You have management in other places. You have more remote control. How do you see that as one of your pillars sort of evolving over time and, and maintaining your community sort of touch? Um, you know, that's, that's a great question, it, but I think it, it plays out differently. So while we're in some really small towns, we're also in and around LA uh, with, with very few offices. And um, so I think that part of our culture is this thing about giving back, whether it's our, our teams get together and support Meals on Wheels or the um, um, Habitat for Humanity. You know, there is uh, there is an element generally of giving back. Part of it is um, we weave it into our Community Reinvestment Act activities, but we do things not as a program of of the day. It kind of just gets woven into this is the way we go to market and and contribute. So uh, I would still see that being done. I think that they'll have to kind of think creatively as we have during COVID about how do we do those kinds of things. They've still um, been done over the last couple of years and because there's been probably arguably more need than ever, but, but how they logistically make that happen um, is uh, yet to be seen. And we, we actually do use a lot of consultants, and they do very good work for our company. I'm just not, I'm not sure what, what my, you know, how, why he was scarred in that way. <laughs> way in the back there. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, I would say, firstly, that for those of you that couldn't, I don't know if y'all could all hear that, he was asking about how do you balance technology with, with security. And, and I will say, in, in our industry, in, information security is preeminent. And, and so it would be a blocker. If we didn't think we could keep either bank information or client information secure, then it would be a no-go. So... Um, so I think that that's an ongoing, and, and banks and, and other industries are investing heavily and will continue to invest heavily in information security. The, the thing that I'm learning about things like DocuSign is it's not just the, the signature. It really is this whole way information flows 
through your company. And um, the challenge we have is that you might solve it in one spot, it's like a balloon, but when you squeeze it, you've, you've solved the problem here for your salesperson maybe, but you really haven't eliminated the work yet. You've just pushed it one way or the other. And so what we're trying to do is figure out what are the most leveraging um, act activities or tasks that we're doing and try to take it straight through. So it's part DocuSign, it's part of, uh, we use a technology called Pathways to, to keep from having to either re-enter that data or at the end of the line have somebody print it out, walk it 100 yards and stick it in a file. That um, it, it was a lot more um, technical and, and a, little, a bit more complicated than, than really just, oh, just have DocuSign and, and do that. But I think that the um, authenticated space and how, how particularly with, with clients, um, desire to have information at their fingertips, the information security and how to do that in ways that are safe for the bank and safe for our customers is a, is a huge issue. You know, growing up, um, while my, my father and his brother had very different personalities, as you do in families, that the thing that was preeminent was you always love and trust your family. And my siblings and I have um, three, four siblings, four, there are five of us, four siblings. And we all live together. We live practically in the same neighborhood. We spend a fair amount of time together. And, um, and I can honestly tell you that, that we, love and trust each other and know, and I know that if any of my siblings said anything to me, it would be coming from the right, I might not like to hear it, but I would know that it would be coming from the right place. So, so that to me is the, the, the first thing, that you have to start with that basis of trust. Now, having said that, um, in, in our company, uh, my brother was the precious firstborn male child with four sisters coming behind. And I say this a little in jest, but my, we all love my brother. Um, and, but he was, again, I, I shared with you that my um, father and my uncle were a little bit more male-oriented. So Frank, I think, was groomed for 13 years as the heir apparent <laughs> I'm in the background. And I'm, but I like all my jobs. I'm, I'm learning and, and whatever, but we were working with um, an executive consultant, which I think is another thing that is very helpful to have somebody to help you learn self-awareness and, and, and learn, raise your EQ about your, your family and, um, and understand where they're coming from a little bit better. And we, I was talking to him one day and said, you know, it, it is kind of bugging me that my brother's the chosen one and I haven't been chosen. And I think I was probably overcompensating too, trying to be in the female and, and trying to prove that I'm good enough. And, and we were talking about it, and he goes, well, what would you have to do to you know, kind of put your, you know, better position yourself? And I'm like, well, I need to have a better relationship with my uncle. And, but I, I mean, I knew my uncle, but I, I didn't spend any time with my uncle. And he certainly didn't know me as an employee in, in the company. And he goes, well, why don't you, you know, no victims, why don't you do that? And I'm like, how would I do that? Um, and he goes, well, make an appointment. And I'm like, well, what if he doesn't want to see me? <laughs> I mean, it's literally, this is going through my head. And I'm getting a little emotional at this point. And uh, he says, well, then you'd know. And so I would create opportunities to go visit my uncle. I would. Call, you wouldn't, I didn't email him, and if I did, he wouldn't have opened his computer because he didn't do that. Um, but I would call his secretary and go, I have an update on whatever it was that I was doing that I thought he might be interested in. And over that time, I really did develop a very close relationship with my uncle that I, that I couldn't have advanced in my company without him doing that. So I think that that would be a, you know, a definitely a 
a pillar. And, um, and also, I think in a family business, you do have this, you know, you're, you're striving for success, and as, as most young business, business people do. But you're also kind of overcoming maybe the psychological, I'm not good enough. You know, that, that everybody in the company is looking at you because you're the boss's kid, and, and you probably got your job just because of that. And so you're, you're trying to overcome a lot of it. You also have to shed that stuff. And, and learn that it's not all about you. You actually do better when you work through other people and empower them and, and really learn, learn a little bit more effective leadership. So those would be kind of four, three or four things that make sure that the bond is there. Le learn yourself and other people. Um, make sure your relationships are right with those that, that have, will have an impact on your career. And... Um, and, and let go of the baggage that's going to hold you back. Hi, Bo. I'm Katie Masood. I'm here on the advancement team with Keenan Slidler and have the pleasure of working with our alumni community. Many students here will be graduating in just a couple of months and will become part of the Keenan Slidler alumni network. We'd love to hear your advice to them on how they can best leverage their connections long after they leave. So, um, and I'm not going to totally answer it, but um, I did poll my team in case I was asked about advice for you. And, and one of the first things on my list was make sure that you are developing your network of friends and colleagues um, that are fostered here at Keenan Flackler because they will serve you so well uh, throughout your life in, in lots of different ways. Um, you know, we talked a lot about culture. I would say pay attention to the culture of the company that, that you are going to because you will be tagged with it forever and ever when you have it on your resume. Um, I think these building transferable skills that um, the jobs that, that you may have five years from now may not have even been created yet. And, um, and, and I think that that's so at, whether it is people or, or technical skills that, that they're important. Um, around your network of alums, look for great leaders rather than focusing on specific jobs in your company or great leaders out, outside of your, your company to, to help mentor you. Be willing to forge your career and, and own it. Don't rely on others to always define it for you. Be a continuous learner that look for ways that you can continue to grow and develop. Uh, be a problem solver. Don't just complain about a situation, but come up with a solution. Focus on doing your existing job well. And, um, and always be looking for ways that you can add value. Think about what you're, you like to do and focus on that. I think that um, don't just chase the money. That if you find something in, you enjoy, you, you'll be much better at it. And, and I've been working for a while and, and, and plan to, to keep working for a long time because I absolutely love what I do. And um, career success is a combination of several factors. It is, it's being smart um, or knowledgeable, that's important, um, but it's also having the ability to successfully form alliances and work with people outside of your, your area or your company. And I think that that also connects to, to your alumni base at, here at Keenan Flagler. Um, be flexible, learn from others, and hire people that are smarter than you as well so that, um, and cultivate a different skill set. So I think that when you're thinking about, about the, both your network here and, and your alumni network, um, gravitating and pushing yourself to gravitate to people that are different than you what will really en enrich your learning and um, I think strengthen your leadership. That's great advice. Who's next? Hello, Mark. Thanks for coming. From, from your perch and thinking, where are you seeing the sort of the biggest gaps in your soft skills or hard skills in your industry, given that all the changes happen from banking with the language of the trend that was online, banking and other changes happen? 
Okay, so you may find this surprising in terms of the, the gaps in, in, um, in, in our industry. I honestly think some of the biggest gaps are around coaching and managing people. They're really on the soft side. And um, when, I, when I, I think about the, the advice that I just gave you, in our company, um, and, and as my role has shifted more from being a, a sales manager across the, the country to, to really leading our general bank, and I'm looking at the, the support areas. So a lot of these areas are, are we've kind of transformed the, the front end of the company. We sell differently. Um, you know, we're, we're leveraging a lot of um, technology. We're, we're going into in different industries, different geographies. The back end is really where a lot of the transformation is happening now, where we're going from manual processes to more digital processes. Um, when we think about the industry as a whole, how we lose money. You know, it used to be years ago, and we would be strip counting all the cash and, and closing because we were losing money during, through our branches in cash. That's not how you lose money in banks now. It is more through cyber, um, fraud, those, those kinds of things. So we, you hang on to a lot of processes that really aren't necessary, that your risk management, if you're looking at being more data driven about where are you taking losses and how can you maybe reduce resources that you're spending here and, and put them over here because it's either an emerging area of concern or opportunity, that the biggest gap that I see is that we have managers in more functional departmental areas where they have strong technical skills, but they're not as comfortable coaching up and really um, engaging their teams and having these strategic conversations about how do we need to change what we're doing to, to do better. And, um, and that either they are coaching up or out weak players, developing talent, that um, if I could wave a magic wand, I would shore that up immediately. And in fact, we're, we're having questions about people that are in senior management roles that don't manage people well, that we're, we're probably, we probably can't tolerate having large swaths of an organization not being managed well. Um, because back to the whole conversation about talent and people, that I, I think people, um, the thing that, that really drives engagement and, and then stability in your workforce is waking up every day thinking that you're making a critical difference in your company and, and you're doing it with people that you like. And I think that that takes strong management skills to cultivate. Time for one last question. Right over here. You know, that's a great question, um, because I think that there are, again, that speaks to that, how we do banking is, is changing. You can do it on your phone, you can you know, do it online, um, but the huge gap is that there is huge, there's a huge financial literacy problem in our country that people just don't understand it. And I was talking to one of your classmates that is, um, um, plans to go to, to New York and work for a startup to talk to people in the music industry that, that are doing well about financial literacy and, and how to, I mean, you, and these are not um, people that come from nothing. These are people that, that look like you and I that, that don't have a clue about how to um, manage their money and, be, and, and create a lifetime of success for themselves and their families. So I, I think that the, the big challenge is how do you um, work with people, and, and it's not a one-size-fits-all thing. People have different desires and aspirations. I mean, they're, they're common, common problems and, and common solutions, but a lot of people don't know how to connect those dots. So, so for us, I think we are, we are doubling down in that space, and it's how do we create technical tools that allow people to pick the channel that they want to use, whether it's, it's digital or, or coming into a branch or, or connecting over a phone, 
but um, really having more meaningful conversations with consumers and, and business owners on, on how to structure their finances to create success. Thank you for coming over here, Hope. It's always wonderful to have you. It's been fun. Thank you. All y'all have been a great audience.